absolutely untrue. Michael Franzese's career as a movie producer was interrupted, and he was in handcuffs. Arrested by the FBI on racketeering charges. Authorities described Francis as a young, rich, and dangerous mafia boss. Prince of the Mafia, a title bestowed to a man with many talents. He was tough to chain down, even for the Mafia. Once you take that oath, you're a made guy. That's what they say. You got straightened out, now you're a made guy. And it's, uh, it's a privilege, you know. Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into the legacy of Michael Francesi, the capo regime of the Colombo crime family. <laughs> Born May 27, 1951, Michael Franzesi was the only child of Cristina Capobianco Franzesi. After Cristina split from her husband, Frank Agrio, she married the infamous Sonny Franzesi. This is when Michael found himself under the wing of one of the most daunting and feared members of the Colombo crime family. Sonny, a charismatic and adventurous man, had three beautiful children with his ex-wife, Anna Schiller. But his love life didn't stop there. He then met Michael's mom and fell in love once again, leading to the birth of three more children. Growing up with a total of seven siblings, Sonny's childhood was filled with adventure and excitement. No matter where life took him, Sonny knew that he had a big and loving family that would always support him. But out of everyone in the family, Michael was the closest to his father. Sonny Franzese's title preceded him. He was the underboss of the Colombo family. An old-time capo named Sebastian Buster Alloy brought Sonny into the crime family. From there, Sonny used his razor-sharp wit and fearless attitude to climb the ranks of the family's hierarchy until he became the underboss. As the underboss, he was fully aware of his power and never hesitated to use it. Everyone around him knew this, including Michael. There were many attempts on his head. Once an assassin was hired for a hit on him when he was drunk at a pub. Even in his intoxicated state, Sonny took him down with his bare hands. Sonny was a compassionate man as well. On one occasion, he helped Frank Sinatra's son fill out the seats at his first performance during his early days as a singer, which impressed Sinatra so much that he kissed Sonny's hand as a sign of gratitude. Sinatra did this despite the fact that he was associated with the Genovese family. Oh boy. And now Sinatra went to where he's supposed to go, to the Genovese family, because that's where he was for years, this guy Frankie Blue Eyes. Even though Michael had no direct awareness of his father's other life, he could sense an aura of power and authority around him that fascinated him. For the most part, Michael was blessed with a loving and thoughtful father who played with him, attended all his school games, and talked proudly of Michael whenever he got the chance. His mother, while very loving, had some issues around money and cleanliness. Her constant fussing over cleanliness drove everyone in the family mad. At one point, Michael suggested that Sonny divorce his mother for the sake of their sanity. But Sonny loved her deeply and stuck around through thick and thin. The story of Michael's father is a complex one. When it comes to who his real father is, the man tells the whole story himself. According to him, he is my biological father. According to others, he's not. You know, I don't know if you know how this kind of came out. But my mom was uh, 16 years old when I was born. Allegedly, my dad had an affair with her um, around that time. And he was married at the time. And my grandparents on my mother's side were pretty upset with what happened. And according to my mother, uh, they forced her to marry someone else so that when she gave birth, uh, she'd be married. Um, when my father divorced his wife at that time, uh, my mom divorced her husband, and then the two of them got married. Nevertheless, when he was young, he had a deep-seated insecurity about not having any direct blood relation with his father. His mother's nagging about his father's previous children only added fuel to the fire, making Michael feel like he was burdening his family. The fear of his father turning on him and the added pressure of carrying a particular name until he turned 18 only made his anxiety worse. But fortunately, Sonny accepted Michael as one of his own and never made him feel like he was an outsider. At 
As Michael grew up, his father's reality started becoming apparent because something of that extent couldn't possibly be hidden. It started with an encounter with a detective in front of their house. A young Michael went outside the house to pick up a ball that a neighborhood friend threw a little too far. He was greeted by a big man who flashed his badge, pulled a gun out of his holster and said, see this gun? Shoving the barrel in his face. This is for your father. Bang, bang, he's dead. I said, they didn't frame you because you were a doctor, a lawyer, a priest. They framed you because you were a street guy. Any lifestyle that does that to a family is evil. There's no other way to describe it. This would be one of many incidents that would shape Michael's early years and slowly expose him to his father's truth. As time went by, Michael would read stories in the local newspaper about his father and stay confused as to what his father actually was. One day, when he was about 12 years old, their maid, Pauline, sat him down and told him everything about who his father really was and what the term mafia and organized crimes were. This would open Michael's eyes, but it would still take a long time for him to realize what all of those words meant. In any case, he still loved his father and saw him as his hero. She was greatly affected by my father going away. My younger sister, she was a mess, quite honestly. And then my brother John, you know, drug addict his whole life. Unfortunately for Michael, his time with his father was cut short by an event that would ultimately lead to the Franzese's family dissolution. Soon after, the news of Sonny's mob ties started spreading. The detectives and the police started harassing the family more and more. This deepened the hate in Michael's heart for the police and authorities in general. But the real hit to the young Franzese's family came when his father was arrested on charges of masterminding a bank robbery. The accusations came from four drug addicts who took advantage of Sonny Franzese and allegedly made false accusations against the underboss. At the time of his father's conviction, Michael was 19, an honor student heading into medical school to become a doctor because that's what his parents wanted him to be. I was going to be a doctor. My dad wanted me to go to medical school, so that's what I was pursuing. But when his father was convicted and eventually sentenced to 50 years in prison, Michael's attention shifted to one thing and one thing only, getting his father out of jail. This burning desire consumed Michael for the rest of his life and became the central motivating factor that guided almost all of his decisions. The first decision Michael made was to make a lot of money because money would be the thing that would lead to the eventual release of his father, or so he thought. Over the next four years, Michael did his best to make as much money as he possibly could. He lowered the number of classes he was taking and started building a business in his free time. And one thing that you need to know about Michael is that he was good at business. Really good. With the help of his friend Tony, he started a business of fixing scrap cars, most of them being Ford Pintos and Chevy Vegas, and selling them for a markup. From here, he expanded into a car leasing business on Sherry Valley Road in West Hempstead. 1971. I had an auto body shop, I had a leasing company, I had gone into business with a guy by the name of Tony Morano. Once that business was profitable, he opened Sonny's Pizza near a train station. He anticipated that many hungry people would be waiting for trains and would appreciate a slice of pizza while they waited. And just like that, after 12 months of part-time work, he had started four successful businesses and was earning up to $5,000 per month. Auto dealerships, I had leasing company, I had restaurants that I owned, I had a production company, I had a lot of stuff. They didn't get any part of that. Which in today's economy would be worth about $40,000. And around this time, another aspect of Michael's life was expanding, his love life. He met Maria Caro through another girl that he could not date because the girl's parents would not let her date Michael for obvious reasons. Michael quickly fell in love with Maria, and after many delays on Michael's part, the pair got engaged in 1973. <laughs> Up until now, Michael didn't face any serious consequences for being the son of the underboss of the Colombo crime family, except maybe for the occasional trouble in school and harassment by the cops and FBI agents. But things took a different turn when he started realizing that the Franzese family carried a lot of baggage. I was a target of law enforcement from day one because my dad's name was so high profile. I mean, I had throughout my time in that life, I had 18 arrests. They were on me all the time. 
His trouble started when he was falsely charged with arranging the kidnapping of a judge's daughter. This charge came after Michael discovered a scheme to get his father out of jail. But as soon as the FBI caught wind of that, they immediately shut him down by arresting him. Michael was arrested several times for charges he had nothing to do with. Even after he began scamming the government for millions of dollars, he was still charged with crimes unrelated to his operations. Although Michael had successfully dodged the law several times, the damage all of this caused to his business proved fatal. The six months spent fighting the cases and the legal expenses involved dried up his businesses really quickly. There was bad publicity too, which made things even worse. I had four cases. I was on trial four times. So I was broke. I paid all my lawyers. So I didn't have any money left over. I was in bad shape. After everything was said and done, Michael was left with only $10 in his possession. He and Maria decided to eat at a restaurant, but their meal cost them enough that they walked out with only 13 cents left. This experience left quite an impression on Michael, and he vowed never to let himself be in such a dire financial situation again. In 1975, soon after this event, Michael married Maria. Around the same time, he made up his mind that he wanted to give up on becoming a doctor and focus on business full time. When he broke this news to his father, who was still in prison, he showed some resistance. Dad, I'm not going to school. I had gotten very close to Joe Colombo, who was the boss. And I said, if I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. And uh, he said, if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. But after seeing that Michael had made up his mind, Sonny tried a different angle. Michael, he said, if you're going to be on the streets, you need to do it the right way. I'll send word downtown and you'll be contacted by one of my associates. He'll tell you what to do. Despite not knowing what exactly his father meant, Michael went along with his decision. Next, his father asked him a question that shook him. What would you do if you had to kill someone, he asked. If I had to, I could, Michael heard himself respond. Would it bother you? Depends upon the circumstances. Sonny smiled. Apparently, that was the correct answer. He said, if you ever had to kill anybody, could you do it? And, you know, it's a little shocking to get that. And I thought about it. I said, you know what, Dad, under the right conditions, yeah, I could do it. And he said, that's the right answer. After this conversation with his father, Michael was introduced to the family leader, Thomas DiBella, by Jojo Vitaco. Vitaco had been brought aboard and put on record as one of Sonny's close associates. DiBella gave him an orientation speech in which he said, I want you to understand that La Cosa Nostra comes before anything, which means that the mob family should be his top priority. He continued with, you are your own man. If you are inducted into our life, you and your father would then be equals. Fathers have no priority over sons, and no brother has priority over another. We are all as one, united in blood. Once you become part of this family, there is no greater bond among men. Stay close to Jojo. Whatever he says, you do. When and if we are ready for you, you'll know. Michael was now initiated into the Colombo crime family as a soldier under the wing of Andrew Andy Mush Russo. His name was circulated in all five crime families in New York, and as a sort of background check which could have taken years. Some men waited for up to 20 long years to receive the coveted call to join the family, all to no avail. But Michael didn't leave anything to chance, he played his cards right, making shrewd moves at every turn. For example, he would generously give a portion of his earnings to Russo, creating the impression that working with Michael Franzese always meant reaping massive profits. Nobody ever turned me down because I always made sure that they made money with me. Even if I lost, they made. His fate was sealed on that fateful Halloween night in 1975 when Jojo took Michael to a small office in a catering house located around Bensonhurst. The office led to a ballroom which was dimly lit and the mood was just as dark as the room. In the middle of the room sat DiBella, the family boss. Are you ready to take the oath of La Cosa Nostra? The big man asked. Yes, Michael answered. The oath is if you violate what you know about uh, this life, betray your brothers, you'll die and burn in hell. It's like Saint is burning in your hands. The oath ceremony began, symbolizing the oath taker's commitment to the family. A pistol and a knife are on the table during this ceremony, and it's mo mostly there for symbolic reasons. After taking the oath, Michael was filled with excitement and joy. At a dinner arranged to welcome the newly recruited, Jojo said something that puzzled Michael. 
Now you can pick up your bag of money, said Jojo. And all of the made men in the room broke into laughter. Michael soon realized that the comment was a joke. There was no money waiting for him after he joined the family. Instead, he was expected to give a portion of his earnings to the family and care for other members if they needed assistance. The family wasn't there to pay him, but rather he was there to pay them. Michael Franzese was now a capo in the Colombo family. There was a huge responsibility as you had many soldiers under your command, but with responsibility came many perks, which Michael used to become one of the most successful mobsters of his time. Immediately after getting inducted, Michael got to work, and he used the newfound connections to set up a leasing business with a $600,000 floor plan. He got each car for a discounted price of $20 to $25 instead of the usual $25 to $50. Next, through an associate named Carroza, he found a connection named Luis Fenza with Japan Lines, an international marine cargo company. He formed a shipping container repair firm, and Luis Fenza started sending containers to his firm. Initially, for each container they repaired, Fenza would build Japan Lines for five. As their scam went unidentified, they increased the amount from 1 to 10, then from 1 to 15, and finally from 1 to 20. And just like that, they were making $2,000 a week for work that didn't even get done. He gathered all his profits from the leasing business and the Japan Line scam and put them on the street. This made him around 2K to 3K per week. Michael helped Big Red with the Glen Oak apartment issue. Basil Robert Cervoni, head of the labor union, was causing problems for the Gutermans, who wanted to renovate the place. Michael negotiated a deal that saved the Gutermans six to eight million dollars, and the union got around four hundred thousand dollars. Michael personally earned two million dollars and continued to work with the Gutermans on other projects. But perhaps the biggest scam of Michael's life, and possibly of the past century, took place after this. It all started when Sebastian Buddy Lombardo came to Sonny, Michael's dad, for help, and he got referred to Michael. Lawrence Lorizzo, Sebastian's boss, was having difficulty managing his multi-million dollar gasoline business, which some ambitious thugs were shaking. After some hesitation, Michael decided to intervene by dispatching one of his most intimidating men to the thugs, and they did not bother Lorizzo again. And in return, Lorizzo came up with a scheme that would change Michael's life forever. But it would be Lorizzo who would rat him out later on. The plan was straightforward. The government imposed a 27 cent tax cut on each gallon of gasoline sold. However, they were typically very slow and could go for up to a year before taking any serious action. So Michael and his squad would stall them for as long as possible. And when the time came to pay, they would declare bankruptcy and shut the company down. When the authorities search for the owners, they end up in Panama, where they find a machete-wielding local whose last known location was unknown. They formed a company in Panama called Galleon Holdings that would oversee the whole operation. With the money they made, Galleon Holdings was able to purchase a Learjet and a Belljet helicopter. And you had a Learjet? Yes. You had a helicopter? Yes as well as a 25-foot Chris Craft speedboat and a 40-foot Trojan yacht named John John, both docked at Michael's half-million-dollar home in Delray Beach, Florida. Gallon also custom-ordered the Trump Princess of Winnebago's, a $370,000 mansion on wheels furnished better than most doctors' homes. Michael also purchased an assortment of condominiums and settled Maria and his three small children in a multi-million-dollar Brookville, Long Island mansion complete with its own racquetball court and satellite television system. Michael Franzese knew that his downfall was approaching after reaching his peak. To combat his growing sense of dread and fear, he turned towards Hollywood. Surprisingly, the ex-mobster even produced three movies, all of which failed and didn't make him any profit. In fact, he lost nearly a million dollars on the first movie he made with Jerry Zimmerman. However, his inclusion in Hollywood allowed him to meet a dancer named Cammy, whom he fell deeply in love with and eventually married. Cammy played a significant role in turning Michael's life around and helping him become a devout Christian. 
Michael's downfall was spearheaded by a task force formed especially to take down Michael, the yuppie Don, the mafia's most financially powerful superstar. Representatives from 11 separate states and counties, as well as several law enforcement agencies, held meetings in the federal courthouse in Uniondale with one objective in mind, to capture Michael Franzese. While the Michael Franzese task force worked on collecting evidence on the mobster, he was busy getting his new girlfriend pregnant. In Michael's defense, it was something that she wanted before he got convicted. Michael was a superstar and everyone wanted to be the first to get him. So charges from different directions and the battle to stay out of jail started once again. After a long and hard fight which involved developing several ulcers and going back to God, Michael survived the charges. But then came the task force and they came in strong. This time the charges were big and Michael had no other option but to plead guilty. Cammy's acceptance of his being in prison made agreeing to a plea bargain a great deal easier. As part of the plea deal, he agreed to plead guilty to two of the 28 charges leveled against him. Federal racketeering and tax conspiracy, he received a 10-year prison sentence, was required to forfeit nearly $5 million in assets and agreed to pay an additional $10 million in restitution. He also agreed to plead guilty to 65 counts in Florida, including racketeering, grand theft, conspiracy, theft of state funds, and failure to account for taxes collected. The nine-year Florida sentence would be served concurrently with the 10-year federal sentence. The $15 million federal agreement would cover a Florida restitution fee of $3 million. The reputed mobster was sentenced by a federal judge in Brooklyn today to 10 years in prison. Franchise is also ordered to pay nearly $15 million in fines, forfeiture, and restitution for his conviction on racketeering and tax conspiracy. And that was the end of his mob life. During his time in jail, Michael claimed to have found God and claimed to become very close to him. He claims that he is a devout Christian to this day. Later on, Michael would find that he had a death contract on his name, that the family's boss put in his name and which his father approved of. But when confronted, his father denied the allegations. As of today, Michael makes frequent appearances on TV shows and even has a YouTube channel of his own. He shares in-depth stories he has from his life as a mobster. He even engages with other big-time mobsters of his era on different podcasts. What are your thoughts on Michael Franzese's story? Did he get what he deserved? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more.